Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 185, End of an Era, The Last Sean Con. I'm Sean, soon to no longer be from Hamilton, and here with me, live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So this past weekend, we had what was very likely the last ever Sean Con, where we played 10 different games. And today we're going to get to hear, you're going to get to hear our thoughts on those games. We know our thoughts, at least I hope we do. Um, after that, we've got a detailed yet short review of Shikoku, one of those 10 games. Now, we'll still be wrapping up with our usual week in review since I got in a couple more games even after Sean headed back up the 401. Welcome to the suggestion box. Here we highlight our some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up this first, is why I shouldn't just read the notes while trying to play with Web Captioner. Up which first, is clearing. There we go. Up first, a comment on our scythe review from Ralph Maza. It's an ingeniously bizarre map. On the one hand, props for the clever solution to the age-old problem. On the other hand, I think I'd actually prefer a more intuitive map that solved the player number problem with modular boards, as that would allow for eliminating the overly fiddly river crossing rules, which are only necessary to make the, make the map work. Well, thanks for that, Ralph. Uh, I do have to agree, the river walk rules are definitely fiddly. I think it was our third game when we finally got them completely right. And even then, some of the players still hadn't quite grasped them. Now, I know there's a Scythe modular map expansion out there, and I do wonder if that does anything to fix the problem. Personally, I'm guessing not. I figure it probably just changes up what the starting hexes are just outside each of your faction bases, so then changing up the starting resources. But I could be wrong. So if you happen to know if you've got that expansion, I would love to know. Well, next, a comment from Jacob Wood on our talk about Pandora Total Destruction. This was a great episode with some really in-depth explanations. I already own a copy, but watching this helped me wrap my head around a few of the concepts that were new. Thanks for such a great recap. Well, thanks, Jacob. I'm glad our talk helped you figure out parts of the game. That's pretty awesome. Well, Willie Felderman commented on our starting a community gaming event segment from way back in episode 139. This is an excellent video. I'm putting together a board game event. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, Willie. Uh, it's always great to see that our older content is still finding an audience. Glad we could help. Next, we have a comment from George Schiffor on our Revolution of 1828 review. George writes, getting this book thanks to you and your review. The Birth of Modern Politics. Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, and the election of 1828. Pivotal moments in American history. So this one kind of surprised me. So this just goes to show you that there are indeed some people out there who are interested in the theme of Revolution 1828. And also that the game may lead people to actually learn something about history. So that's more of a win than I expected for Renegade Games there. All right, well, let's finish up with a couple of comments on last week's topic of games where you get to play the monster. The Cult of Pop writes, Dysonstein has you dig up parts to build a monster and fight other players' monsters. Might be the game you reference at a um, you know, given timestamp. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lords of Hellas lets you control the creatures after you build a monument. It's actually a great way to win. And Nyctophobia has a vampire encounter version where one person is the vampire chasing players through the woods. If you know Nyctophobia, all the other players are blindfolded and feel their way through the trees using a tactile board and pieces. And Brock Wager commented, No Skulk Hollow? That's the best one. Well, thanks both of you for the comments. Um, no, Dyson Steen is not the game I was thinking of, though it does sound neat though not quite fitting the theme, because again, you're playing someone building the monsters, not the monsters themselves. Again, ignoring that whole Frankenstein's the real monster thing. Um, as for that other game that we played, I know it was with my friend Mike Barker and his son, and I'm going to have to reach out to him on Facebook or something at some point 
Um, unfortunately, we haven't really talked since the the pandemic. And find out if he knows what it was. Like, I can picture the game. It was in a long box. And I remember putting dice on a player board. And that's about it. Now, as for Lords of Hellas, I haven't played that game. I've heard good things. Um, I know Tex got a copy for sale right now, last I saw. Um, this, to me, sounds like an honorable mention at best. Like, you're playing a game where you can potentially control a monster, which is a good way to win. But that's a little bit of a stretch for actually playing the monster. Now, Nyctophobia Vampire Encounter is a great suggestion. This is a great one versus many game I should have totally thought of since we've reviewed the game and I still have it in my collection downstairs because it's one of the most unique and thematic and, um, what's the word, immersive games I actually own. Skull Callow also should have been on the list, but it's one I hadn't played and totally forgot about. So I wish Brock had seen my original tweet. He's like, I must have missed your tweet because I would have totally called that out because it is the best one. So this is based on uh, games like Eco or Shadow of the Colossus, where you literally play like a titan in that game. And I got to say, there's definitely playing a monster going on there. And that game sounds awesome. Well, and that's where we're going to stop tonight. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. A few announcements before we move on. Okay. There's a few things here. So first off, there is a small chance we won't be recording next week. Uh, Deanna and I are going out of town at the start of the week and are planning to be back here in time to record. We're coming home to Windsor on Wednesday. Now, well, this is going to cut into my prep time and I'm not going to really have time to work on show notes this weekend coming up. So we're probably doing AMA. We should at least be good to record. But just in case something comes up, I don't even know, bad traffic, whatever it happens to be, we get stuck, who knows? And we don't make it back to Windsor on time, there is a small chance we may have to cancel. Just right. watch social media for that. We just want to give people a heads up. We might not be here. We should, though. We really should. And then next up, I finally did confirm that I am actually having this tooth extracted on September 7th. So it's not a consult. It's actually getting pulled. And based on my previous experience with getting teeth pulled, I can't see being in any shape to record that night. So we're going to call it right here and now. We will not be recording a show two weeks from now on the 7th of September. Well, next up, something much more positive. It's time to announce our four-year anniversary giveaway. This is the one where we're giving away one of the best games we've ever reviewed, including Unfair, Space Base, Lost Ruins of Arnak, and Garinto. And the winner is... Brian Sheehan, whose winning entry came from being a subscriber to our newsletter, which you can also be at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, thanks for entering, Brian, and for your longtime support of the show. Brian is also one of our awesome Patreon patrons, so I know it's going to a good home, which makes me happy. Congratulations, Brian. I'm looking forward to hearing what game he chooses. And now, let's get on with the show. We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. So tonight's question is, what games did we play at the last ever Sean Con, and what did we think of each of them? That's right. This past weekend, I was down in Windsor, and while there, we got in plays of 10 different games. Tonight, we're going to both be sharing our thoughts on those games, all of which, well, not all of which, most of which were new to me, but a couple of older. New new, yeah. new features. Yeah, I was going to say, the, you had never played the production copy of Grint, so I thought they were uh, all new to you. Because no, because uh, witches. Herb witches? Herb witches. See, okay. All right. Fair enough. Did you play with the witches before? <laughs> yeah. All right. Close enough. Almost all were new to Sean. Now, I just said this was going to be the last ever Sean Con, and at this point, we are pretty sure that's true. Um, for those that missed it last week during our announcement section, we let everyone know that Sean has started the process of moving down here to the edge of Windsor, about 20 minutes away from where I am here in the East End. There is still a lot of work to be done, and as mentioned before, this may end up disrupt disrupting our regular schedule. It shouldn't be too long, though, before we're both together in the same area again. And while once Sean moves down here with us being able to game together won't be such a big deal, and it seems kind of silly to call it Sean Con anymore. I'd hope when he's here, we're probably going to game together pretty much every weekend and be able to say, it's Sean Con this weekend. It's another Sean Con. It's Sean Con number 365. Uh, so there's a pretty good chance at this point that last weekend was the final ever Sean Con. But it will be missed. 
but I'm not there yet. So, so this past weekend when Sean was in town, we played a lot of games. Um, some of these were with Kat and Tori on Friday night, which were a mix of four and five player games. Others were played with the three of us, Deanna, Sean, and I. And Sean and I also got in a couple of two-player games as well. Overall, in the end, it ended up being 10 different games, including some expansions. Um, and most of the games played were played more than once, which is actually a little rare from when Sean's in town. Usually we tried it, well, except for the one time we mashed <laughs> in a whole bunch of Draconis Invasion in one weekend. Uh, most of the time we try to play as many different games as possible. But this time there were some games worth playing more than once. Indeed, but enough preamble. Let's get on to the games. So what I thought would be interesting here tonight to talk about these games is to talk about it based on how often they got played this last weekend. Starting with the games we only played once and finishing with the game that got played the most. Let's build some anticipation and let's see if people can guess what our most played game this past weekend was. Sounds like a plan. So up first, we played a two-player game of Super Motherload. I'm saying up first. It wasn't actually the first game we played, but the... The one player game, one of the games we played once was a two player game of Super Motherload. Now, this is a unique deck building game uh, from Canadian designers published by Roxy Rox Lee Games. Uh, it's got a sci fi theme of mining an alien planet for gems and artifacts and trying to build the best mining crew for the job. Now, the actual game is about playing your crew cards to dig and bomb deeper into the ground in a very dig dug like style. Digging gets you gems as well as other useful items or abilities like drawing more cards. Now, the gems are used to buy more crew cards with a rather unique purchasing mechanism. Now, the real twist here to me is the fact that you aren't actually scoring the gems or even how deep you mind or how much you mind. Instead, it's how much you've improved your crew and the number of achievements you earn during play that wins you the game. So this was the first time you ever tried this one. I know you've heard us talk about it on past episodes when we played with Tori and Kat. What did you think of Super Motherload? Honestly, this was super fun. And I could see playing it way more often as a sort of a longer filler. Uh, when, you, when you know you want a game, but you don't have the time for something more meaty, but you also don't, you know, you know you don't, you've got more than just a 15-minute quick, right. quick game. You've got maybe an hour, but you don't have the time to do all the setup and everything else of a a bigger meteor hour long game. Fair. Um, I would say with the pair of us, even with the teach, it, it felt like it was under an hour, which is the box time yeah. on it. Yeah. The, the, I'm guessing the boss time is more for three or four players. Right. Yeah. Person. I really dig this game. It's, it's unique. Um, I like unique games. I like games that do something different. Um, the whole digging with these weird tunnel uh, tiles to cover up like, and, and is neat. And, but what I like the most actually is, the card buying system. I love the way you take the gems and you have to put them on your people and you don't get the card until you get to a certain total and the, the early crew costs 10, then the next one's 15, 20 and so on. And there's this whole thing where you don't want to overspend and you get a really good gem and you really want to put it on this card, but you're going to waste money. So do you start someone else? And there's just lots of interesting decision points with it. Now, my one problem with the game, which we found when we played a whole bunch of times in a row, and note this wasn't pile obligation, we weren't trying to like shove it all in, it was just new to me, so I was showing it off to everyone, is I found the game started to feel the same. There isn't a lot of different things in the game. Everyone starts off with the same deck. Yes, there are some asymmetry there with card abilities, but basically it's, you know, dig, bomb, dig with a rainbow, um, you know, in the boards, there are two sides to each board, which is nice, but once you've seen them, you've seen them all. So because of that, for me, this is one I'll take out now and then. Especially Sean shows up. He's never played it. And I can totally see the next time Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, comes over, be like, hey, check out this Dig Dug game. And the next time I run an event at CG Realm, be like, check out this Dig Dug game. But it doesn't seem like a game that I'm going to be like, every one day when my Monday group comes over, we're going to play. I think you're going to get sick of this if you play it too often. But if you space it out, really solid game. Yeah, I could I can definitely see playing, you know, banging out a, a bunch of games in that would certainly grow tiring. Uh, but at the same time, I could see, you know, every once in a while, you know, every couple of weeks, once a month mm -hmm. or something like that, pulling that out. And uh, I think because of the the difference in decks mm -hmm. uh, alone between the, the difference of decks uh, combined with the difference in boards, even though there aren't that many boards, um, you could have it, it could feel like uh, still feel fun without growing too tired. Now, if I remember correctly, there's also a system in the book for drafting your starting deck instead of starting with the, the starting four. But you know what? It's been a while. Ago. 
I will say it was kind of on my pile of maybe get rid of, but then once we played it with Sean, I'm like, I, it had been enough time. And I was like, no, this game's actually better than I thought. So yep. it, it's back firmly on the shelf to stay there for now. Now, our next single gameplay was a three-player game, a Brew Crafters travel card game, which we played on the patio at the Walkerville Brewery. Now, here, D and I grabbed a pint, Sean grabbed a cider, and we had some awesome Detroit-style pizza from Slices a couple doors down. Uh, this included the Detroit Muscle Pizza, which I love. It's a pretty traditional um, Detroit-style pizza. But we also tried a Detroit Cuban pizza, which was a pizza with pulled pork, mustard, and pickles on it. Now, before I get to the game we played, what'd you think of Walkerville and Slices? Uh, you know what? I The pint of Argyle cider was great, and it was also a nice, great callback to my grandparents, who used to live on Argyle Street right there in Walkerville. Yeah, which is one of the streets the the, the brewery is on, which yeah. is why I think they go with that name. Yeah, so as for the pizza, it was solid Detroit style. I mean, you're mm -hmm. getting the right stuff there. Uh, and I enjoyed the both the taste of both. I think, though, in hindsight, I would probably order the Cuban again nice. over the okay. Mitza. Uh, while not bland, I found the oh. Mitza just wasn't quite as flavorful as the Cuban. Uh, and that was a selling point for me. Um, and oh. for anyone who's confused, the Cuban is based off of the Cuban sandwich. Uh, yep. So, Yeah, I was confused. I didn't know what a Cuban sandwich was. <laughs> I, I, Deanna felt the same. Deanna preferred the Cuban to the Mitza, but uh, I, I, I love the Detroit mu muscle. I, it, it's fantastic. That is one of the best Detroit style pizzas. It, I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Professor Za, but it's up there with your Roni rubber. It, it is damn good and, and personal instead of way too much food. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I brought you there to try the Detroit muscle. Well, I didn't mind the Cuban. I, it was okay. There was definitely that sushi effect going on. I do not like, Dill pickles. I hate <laughs> mustard. Pulled pork I'm okay with. But like somehow it, there was also ham and something else going on there. Cheese, of course. I, I didn't love it, but I am glad I tried it. It definitely works. It just wasn't for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I can absolutely see where a lot of people would be avoiding that, <laughs> that pizza. But people should try it is uh, all I'm saying. Give yeah. it a shot. You never know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and again, if you like Cuban sandwiches, absolutely oh, yeah. try it because I think this is a stunning pizza version of a Cuban sandwich, which is something I would never consider. Yeah. Yeah, we got we to gotta fix that. Maybe the next time Sean's in town, we'll meet up with Kevin and we'll do the same. There we go. So speaking of gaming, so someone in our chat wants to join us for some of this. So, <laughs> oh, Wear Gator's here. Yeah, hey, Wear Gator's hey, back Gator. again. And yes, it awesome. is amazing. Yeah, it's, it's cool. I, I don't know if I shared a picture of that one yet. But anyway, we're here to talk games. So whenever we talk Sean Con, we got to squeeze some food in. Um, next on the list was Brew Crafters Travel Card Game, right? Like uh, we, we were playing this. This is a multi-use card game where the cards can be used as two different things. A tableau-based engine builder. You're going to have a row of cards out, some cards in your hand. You're going to draft two cards. Then either play a card from your hand into your tableau to improve your brewery or play a set of cards as ingredients. So every card's an improvement or an ingredient. Now, the brewery upgrades do all kinds of things like letting you draft cards for free, provide end game scoring, or make the brews, the beers you do brew worth more points. Now, each different type of beer from ale to special reserve takes more ingredients, but the ones that take more ingredients are worth more than renown. So it, it's just a neat kind of interesting mix of the multi-use cards, really simple to learn. What do you think of Brew Crafters Travel Card Game? So, I mean, this was super simple, quick, and easy to learn. Uh, and despite the three of us having varying strategies mm -hmm. and knowledge of the game, uh, we all ended within one point at the end of the game. Um, so there's definitely, you know, it, it's it's a forgiving game yep. uh, as well as just being, you know, quick and quick and simple. It, it would be hard to imagine not picking up that game really fast. Yeah. And, and to me, what was nice is I never played a three players. I'm still I'm still looking forward to playing four because four has a thing where you play teams like you're each a each okay. the team in the brewery oh, yeah, you're only two breweries yeah the there's only two breweries competing but so i, I still need to try though but i guess i did like it with three and honestly like i honest i have no clue maybe we're doing the bad thing where we're recommending games that are no longer available that is possible i i apologize if we are but this is a true hidden gem uh quick and easy to teach cool theme mechanics that I actually think tied in pretty well 
Like, what do you spend your money on? Do you spend it on improving your brewery or buying ingredients and brewing beer? Like, it, it all kind of fit. And this is one, the more you play, uh, the more strategy you see. Like, once you start realizing there's only um, four fruit and four coffee in the deck, and if you take that coffee and instead play it as your HR manager, that removes the coffee from the whole game, so it might screw over that other player who's going for a coffee strategy. Stuff like that, I thought was really neat. And and it would record, reward some card counting. I guess I really do dig the game. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and I guess uh, if it didn't have the card blowing away issue on the patio, yeah. it would be nearly perfect for pub crawls. Um, mm -hmm. I do think the holders give Racco the edge at, at the pub crawl, uh, even if Brewcrafters itself as a game is more portable. True. I think we just need a set of those tight hands to hold the cards. We'll just get those. Yeah, I no, we don't. Uh, um, at least not if you like the edges of your cards lasting. For the majority of people not in the know, Mo, Mo is referring to a product which we were asked to promote, which would unquestionably damage your cards while holding them upright or allowing you to build card towers by cheating with, you know, reinforced mechanical advantage. I, uh, they seem like they might be useful, but I would only want to use like nice plasticized bicycle cards when using them. Yeah. I don't think my brew crafters travel card game cards would hold up. No, no, that was more of an inside joke. For sure. <laughs> All right, moving on. My biggest surprise of the weekend, Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. Uh, this one was sent to us from Japan and Games, so thank you for that. Uh, this is a deck building game, pretty traditional deck builder based on the famous anime where you take on the one of the crew of the bellhop or of the bebop, not the bellhop. I see that and it looks like bellhop. You play one of the crew of the bebop and travel between three different planets. Planets? Wow. You play one of the crew of the bebop and travel between planets, hunting bounties, all of which come from the show. There we go. Better. Uh, eventually, the game does shift to hunting down and capturing or defeating Vicious. It uh, features some really well done team up mechanics. And despite being a competitive game, you're still able to use each other's abilities in a very interesting way, um, which really does a lot to tie in the theme into the mechanics. Because like your unique player abilities and having to collect fuel to travel, as well as awesome components like one of the best box inserts we've ever seen fantastic looking minis double layered player boards and this is not a kickstarter game what were your impressions of cowboy bebop space serenade yeah i the, the i i had forgotten to comment on the uh on the box insert because yeah it was free. really i mean every little there was no need for plastic baggies everything mm -hmm. fit and was held in place in its own place Perfectly. Like it just, even the components that you built after punching, there yeah, was basis there was for some, it. Everything, there was you know, a bit of assembly. Yeah. Everything, everything just fit back in the box perfectly. Uh, the only, the other strange thing was why they gave you standees and some yeah. reasonably nice miniatures. <laughs> yeah. I honestly, this really feels like they were going to kickstart it and the miniatures were going to be a stretch goal that they were going to give you whether they hit it or not. Yeah. And maybe. I, and I think COVID might have interfered with that. I don't know. That, that's, that's, speculation though possibly now while there was one somewhat odd rule regarding movement that that still yeah. seems a little strange to me uh aside from that uh and it wasn't a deal breaker at all it was just sort of like a, oh i wonder why you have to do that uh yeah. it was a solid game uh with some interesting mechanics in the combos that weren't as simple as oh just make sure you get all the cards for this character and mm -hmm. you'll be able to do all the fancy combos. Well, no, because the combos varied as to who who could combo off of what and the way the colors worked. Yeah. Uh, and that and that made for some really interesting and, and thoughtful play. You weren't just grabbing the most expensive card from the market. Yeah, the thing it did here was kind of like the Star Realms thing, right? Where it's like, oh, if you have a green card and you play another green card, they combo off. But it tends to be in Star Realms that your green cards combo with your green. Whereas this one, there were four different colors for the four characters. But there were combos for each of the other characters. So it wasn't like your red cards combo off your red. It's your your red card you just played combos off a yellow you played earlier. And it was right. really neat. Yeah, the dual color cards made for an interesting. Uh... Yeah, very, I, overall, I was really impressed by this. Like, like it just was way better than I was expecting. And, and it's not like I was expecting it to be bad. I just wasn't expecting it to be as good as it was. I love the fact that all four characters are in play no matter what. So you have the four bounty hunters in play and how moving other characters around to best make use of their special abilities was a big part of the game. 
And I dig that, like, even playing together, you could move someone that doesn't necessarily want to help you. And then they have to come help you, which I got to say is a good thematic tie in to Bebop for anyone who's seen the show. It's not like the four of the characters always just like happy go lucky, one at things on their own. How many times did Faye steal them out? Bounty, right? Now, at this point, we've only played once, but so far, uh, this seems like a hit. Like, if you're a Bebop fan, this is probably worth picking up. Yeah, I'm interested to see how this plays out at different player counts. Mm -hmm. But at three, it was definitely a solid game. Um, And while uh, certainly helpful for the fun, I don't think knowledge of the series is a complete requirement. No, definitely not a requirement, but I do think it helps, especially knowing the characters and even the 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 bounties right knowing you're going after teddy bomber or whatever like you're gonna recognize it and you're gonna have fun there um actually i'll find out this probably this weekend we'll play with a couple who have never seen cowboy bebop see how that goes works now i will note at this point that this game does predate the netflix series so i will say even knowledge of the netflix series is going to help though you're probably not going to realize who one of the characters are because they only show up in kind of like an end credit scene but you'll at least recognize the other three characters and most of the bounties and the whole vicious thing. Indeed, this is unquestionably the anime. But since they've already canceled the live action, I doubt it's going to be remembered all that long anyway. Ah, very true. Very true. Maybe it'll be the next Firefly and people will be talking about it for years. Now, our only five player game of the weekend was a game of the Quacks of Quillenberg with the Herb Witches expansion using all my shiny new geek up bits. Thanks again, kids. Um, I think most people know Quacks, but I'm going to go over it just in case you don't. Uh, This is a push-your-luck game about drawing ingredients from a bag and adding them to your pot while trying not to explode and getting points and the ability to buy more ingredients each round. Herb Witches adds new ingredients and recipes as well as witches that give you a way to mitigate the randomness and uh, add other scoring opportunities. And that's about as short as I can explain Quacks. Now, we've all played Quacks before and the expansion, but this is the first time you actually got to play with the Geek Up bits. That's the part I was thinking about, how it was new to you. Are they not awesome? Yeah, what a huge difference they make. Uh, you can still get bad pulls, but yeah. it feels like luck is the problem and not that you're worried about things being wedged in the corner mm-hmm. of the bag. Yeah, I know a lot of people are still like, hey, you're going to get the rounded bags, you're going to get the rounded corner bags, don't you need the bags? But I'm not even sure if they're needed now. Sure, it would be cool, but at the cost, I, I don't think I can justify it. Uh, I did notice there was one pull where I noticed something. I had, I had the bag held at an angle, and so there was a, a corner here and a corner here. And as I was shifting it, uh, and I think I was, I was giving up, I noticed that there was someone caught in the top corner. So okay, they aren't so all... it's still possible. Yeah, it's, but... not, it's not perfect, but I mean, I, I, if I'd given it a bigger shake, it probably would have yeah. just fallen down. Like all the mid stuff, there's still corners. Stuff gets in there, but like you don't not notice it as much. Yeah, it's like not you, it's not anywhere near the problem yeah. it was uh, before. So, what do you think of this play? Because I know you haven't played it nearly as much as us. No, no, no. So, having seen more of the ingredients now, what I find is that there are. It, it feels really clear that there are some that are, I are at least in in opinion better than others. Okay, so so. Do you mean individual ingredients are better? Types of the ingredients are better? Like, like I know there are some I prefer, but I don't know if I call them better because they affect everyone, right? Like, none of it feels game-breaking. Like, oh, there's a broken ingredient. Well, everyone can buy it, so how is it broken? Like the six pumpkins. Everyone takes the time to save up. You can all buy them. Or you mean the, the, the fact that, like, no one's going to buy the yellows this game because they're garbage? Yeah, I guess more enjoyable instead of better, I guess, is probably right. a better word. Uh, some flavors of the different ingredients just aren't as much fun okay. uh you know with preferences for which version of an ingredient you're going to want to see on, come up mm. uh, developing the more you play it yeah i'll admit i've had that since the first time we played the, the the blue crow's head where you get to pull a number of tokens out of your bag based on the the number on the ingredient then you get to pick that like out of those you play one and the rest go back and that's still my favorite ingredient I, i'm sure every group probably has their own list of their preferred <laughs> ingredients and I, at some point, I'll probably get to a point where I'm like, we're going to play with this set or I'm going to make a notepad file and list what my favorite set is. I still like randomizing them, though. Yep. Next up, we have uh, what I'll call the biggest disappointment of the weekend, and that is Aldabas, Doors of Cartagena, uh, which Grand Gamers Guild shipped up to us from Gen Con, thanks to fan of the show, Kevin. 
I'm sorry to say, Mark, this one is a little bit too overwhelming for the first couple of plays. Now, All the Boss is a tableau building area majority game where players are playing doors with very fancy knockers on them. That's the whole Cartagena thing. Um, onto the table, forming a three by four grid. Now, each card played triggers a special effect and then activates the doors beside it and blow it. Don't forget that on your first play. Uh, point scoring is pretty opaque, um, especially the first time through with only the players having the most and second most influence in each door suit actually scoring everything. And it's one of those where like not everyone scores everything and all that matters that you score is if you're the winner in those two suits. And honestly, even trying to describe it quickly here, it sounds like a lot. And that's because it is. Now, I got to say, you didn't seem to dig this one much yourself. Uh, I wouldn't say I didn't like it. Um, the first play was certainly tricky to catch all the details. Mm -hmm. And then, unfortunately, on that second play, we saw a potential strategy that may or may not be badly skewed. Yeah. Um, honestly, until that emerged during scoring, I was actually enjoying it once I, you know, because I, I that second play, I'd sort mm -hmm. of figured out the rules and was feeling more confident about my play. Yeah, the second game definitely went way better than the first game. I almost feel like there should be a teaching game with only three suits or something. I don't know. It's just that, that the real problem to me seems like the game's overwhelming. Um, in the same way, Race for the Galaxy is the first time you play. It's it. a front. It's, just, it's a front loading issue. Yeah, uh, there are a ton of icons and multiple suits to keep track of. Was it six suits in the base game without the expansion? Either six or five. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, off. Um, and then each suit score is completely different from the other, and then the influence range on each suit's different. And I guess I, after two plays, things started to make much more sense. But I think it's that learning curve that kind of impacted our impressions. Now, I think there's a good game here. We just got to get through the door, right? I just think we haven't gotten to the level of mastery to really see, uh, to have this game shine. Um, something I'm really tempted to start calling the side effect based on our review from a couple weeks ago. I just feel like I need to play with this game and explore it more. At this point, I haven't given up. Um, I look forward to trying it again. Now that everyone knows what's going on a bit better, I have a feeling our next couple plays will be better. Yeah, right now, my only real concern about the game is this one strategy and whether or yeah. not it's overpowered. Uh, or if it was just a fluke. Uh, sure. And then I would do worry that even if it's kind of a fluke, if you've got an experienced player who can counter it, if you've got experienced players playing with new players, it's pretty easy to take advantage of that uh, that when a new player if if the new if you do need to count actively counteract this right yeah i can totally see that though at this point what i probably think it like if i do discover yes that one strategy seems pretty powerful as a game teacher i would just point out that particular strategy hey watch for players doing this um i remember i was playing a game of fleet with the designers and i got to get two of oh is it? it's like the fishing contract and and here Matt Riddle's like, don't oh, let him get a second. Oh, you let him get a second fishing contract. You never let anyone get a second <laughs> fishing contract. So maybe that's all it is. But at this point, we played twice, right? Like this is not a formal final review. Um, I have we looked on Board Game Geek and like Twitter feeds and stuff. I didn't see anyone else complaining about this dominant strategy, which I'm not mentioning because I don't want anyone else to, like yeah, exactly. there and start <laughs> trying to use it. I don't want to, I don't want to give it away, but I, I haven't seen anyone else complain about a dominant strategy. So it could have been a fluke. And honestly, this is why we try to play most of our games at least five times before sharing our final thoughts. Yeah, indeed. It could just be that we had a new player at the table uh, and I hadn't considered that particular idea. So mm -hmm. with a few of the right draws unopposed, you were able to run with it. Yeah. Uh, it, it is definitely worthy of exploration, though, to find out whether or not. Yeah, it was one of the, I played the first game and I was like, okay, I, there's one thing I get about this game. This seems like a good way to get points. So I decided to like, Totally lean into that the second game and like more than doubled everyone else's. <laughs> All right. Next, Garinto. Sean's obviously played this before, but I had actually forgotten that the only time he played was the prototype copy that we played in January of 2019 at easy mode, which was for my birthday before all the lockdown started. So he's never actually gotten to play with the final components. Uh, plus, he hadn't tried the Seasons of Change variant, which I prefer. So added to that, we are also trying out something unannounced that we can't really talk about other than to say it seemed like a really solid addition to the game. Now, we talk about Grinto a lot, but just for anyone who's new to the show, this is a tile drafting and placing game 
where you take element tiles from the path and put them onto the mountain. Note, this is a physical thing with nice, thick, like upwards, like tiles. Um, the When you place tiles onto the mountain, you are then going to take off tiles based on the element you use. Then the number you take off is based on your knowledge in that element, and that's just how many you've already collected in the game earlier. Scoring is randomized at the start of the game and is based on your knowledge of the elements of the end game, so how many of each tile you've collected. It's a brilliant game and honestly one of the best games I've ever played and one of the best games in my collection. So we already know Sean likes the game. He enjoyed it back when we played it. But what was it like playing the production copy? Well, I don't think there's much I can say that we haven't already said about this game in various episodes. Honestly, the only negative is that the tiles are hard to separate by hand. Yeah. Uh, um, otherwise, With one hand. Yeah, yeah. Well, otherwise, it's a more polished version of a game I knew was great. And what do you think of Seasons of Change? So what that one is, is normally when you play Garento, the base rules are you put two scoring cards up and they stay up there for all four rounds of the game. Seasons of Change, you put four up and they rotate, so only two score each season. I prefer that way to play. What do you think? Yeah, I do. I think it makes more sense to have that as the default scoring. Yeah. From what I hear from Mark, that may be the default for the uh, the the next update. If a, if a second edition of Garento, if a reprint comes, that may be an official rule. And it'll probably have a, for your first game, don't do this. But otherwise, this will be where to play. Right. And as for the shiny new thing, uh, we're just going to keep teasing you with this one until Mark tells me I'm allowed to announce it. So stay tuned for more when we're allowed to talk about it. And still publishers, why? Why not let me hype it now? Drives me nuts. NVTS. Bonkers, sorry. Next up. Two plays, Castles of Mad King Ludwig, three players. Uh, first was an extreme play. Second was the proper game with the proper rules using the Secrets expansion. Uh, this is a wonky economic tile placing game um, all about building a castle out of odd shaped rooms of different sizes and corridors and stairs and gardens and all kinds of stuff. Brilliant bits in this game include the room designs themselves and how they actually fit together and a neat system where the active player sets the prices for everything and players, when they're buying tiles, pay that player in money. And that's part of the economy. Um, this particular play was inspired by one of our awesome Patreon patrons who just got the deluxe Kickstarter edition. And man, am I jealous. But as soon as that came up in our Discord, I'm like, Sean, you haven't played Mad King Ludwig, have you? He's like, nope. So out it came. Now, this was your first ever Mad King Ludwig game. What would you think? Ignoring the fact we missed a pretty pivotal rule the first run. Uh, I really need to give this one another chance being unfamiliar with it. And I made some mistakes and poor choices I later regretted. <laughs> Still, it is a solid, fun game. And I think yep. the economic system in it, when you get it right, is really brilliant yes. and, a, and a, a shining feature of the game. Oh, I agree. And and honestly, making mistakes that you later regretted is pretty much the castles of Berg or castles of Mad King Ludwig. Sorry, too many castles of games. <laughs> Learning curve for that game. Like even Deanna and I made some mistakes. Um, now second game, second game we threw in the secrets expansion. This added moats, uh, secret doors, new rooms, and collecting swans, which adds like a set collection element. Personally, I find the secret doors a bit fiddly, but I like the rest of the new additions. And I'm still impressed Deanna actually managed to close in her entire moat. I don't think I'd ever seen that before. What'd you think of the Secrets expansion? Yeah, the Secret Doors, I never got to use. I made some poor choices in uh, early design uh, and blocked myself off. Uh, then combined with poor rooms coming up for my needs uh, and bad directions to head strategy-wise, there was just nothing I could connect that, you know, yeah, two X times zero is still zero. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the secret room's getting two times when you're not scoring your points didn't help. Now you did rock the swan collecting though. You did better than both of us. True. Swans loved my utterly mediocre moat. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you avoided the moat system, which may have been a valid strategy. That is the one thing with secrets is is there's hotly debated. Do you need to build moat to win? And in our game, it worked for Deanna. She did win the game. So I, I don't know if they're totally necessary. Now, the one thing I do want to mention in regards to castles is my folly here. Don't do what I did. If it's been more than three years, see, I was, at first I was saying a year since I played this. No, I haven't played since COVID. So it's been more than three years since I played this game. Don't think a quick flip through the rules, even if they're only about five pages, is going to be enough of a refresher. 
I take the time to actually sit down, reread the rules where everyone else sets the game up, shuffles the tiles or something. I don't know, goes and makes coffee, whatever it happens to be. I totally forgot the rule that you put money on the tiles that aren't taken. And while it didn't ruin the game, it meant that we were all strapped for cash and spent far too many actions just taking five mil from the bank and not actually building things. So our castles were very small. Indeed. And while we do adore printed setup guides uh, from various sources, yes. they aren't as useful if you don't already remember the rules in general. Yes. <laughs> and we made another mistake that, that probably wasn't impactful that I didn't realize the secrets added more tiles. So our stacks of tiles were too tall, which didn't matter because we didn't have the money to buy them anyway. So that didn't actually <laughs> impact anything. But like we had some of the swan cards in and I got to say, that's one part of the game I don't like is the setup with secrets where you're like, I need five of the original tiles and three of the swan tiles and mix them. That's fiddly and annoying. But other than that, I still really dig castles. Yep. Next up comes Shikoku. This is another Grand Gamers game guild sent up from Gen Con. Uh, this is a very unique racing game where you don't want to be in first or last. And it's the players in second and second last who win. Use a very interesting card drafting and player order system that, while simple to learn, rewards players who are paying attention. That's all I want to say about this one right now, because we are going to be reviewing Shikoku later in the show, and we'll have a lot more to say then. Any quick thoughts on Shikoku for now? If you don't mind the end game, it's a quick fun filler for a wide range of ages and skills. Now, what I love the most about this one is its uniqueness. I don't own any other game where it's the players in second and second last that win. That alone makes it worth being in my collection. Collector's gonna collect, y'all. <laughs> Next, we have the second most played game of the weekend. That is Chiseled, the deck sculpting game. Now, again, sent to us from Grand Gamers Guild. Thanks for all these games, Mark. Uh, this is a deck deconstruction game where everyone part starts with an identical 45-card deck. Filled with heads, arms, and bodies in three different materials, as well as a bunch of scrap cards. Each turn, players are going to select a tool card, use it to remove cards from their deck in one way or another. Now, each tool works completely differently, letting you trash different amounts of cards from different places in different orders and so on. Not worth getting into here. Now, the goal is to cut down your deck just enough to be left with the perfect statue before the critics arrive and judge your work. What did you think of Chisel? You know, I wasn't sure what to think of this one, as it almost seemed too easy and simple based on, you know, a quick glance at the BGG page and watching you unbox it. Mm -hmm. Yet with the range of tools you get to work with, yeah. you get some really great interactions and some fun planning to not get stuck with the wrong tool for well, your yes. needs. Uh, so it's not and it's, so it's not just a, sol a, a solitaire game as well. There is that interaction with the other players through uh, both, you know, sort of hate drafting tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a few tools which do interact with other people's decks. Yes. The, 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 my favorite part of this game is when someone does something and it doesn't work. Whether that's you make someone flip over a card or most likely in our first play. And I think this is where we were totally sold on. The game is when Sean grabbed the saw early in the game and basically cut his whole statue in half because he just kept going with this saw and Sean flipping the cards going, no, no, there goes an arm. I can't stop. I can't stop. I need to fix it. Maybe if I cut this chunk off. No, it's worse. That that was an awesome moment. And I will say that is the the worst. Well, actually, it probably paid off in the end. I think you won that. Yeah, game. it didn't actually. Uh, it, 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 it didn't was hurt horrifying. as much as it felt. It was horrifying as it happened, uh, but it actually didn't turn out as as badly as it could. Uh, you know, yeah. losing a losing a couple of bits off the head was the the worst of it. Yeah, and thankfully wax was in place. You were able to replace most of what you lost. Exactly. So it, it turned out pretty good. Games without wax are definitely harder. Um, I really like this one. Like, it, it's better. I re I was curious. I had no clue if I was going to enjoy the game at all. I just wanted to see how it worked. And it ends up, it's really good. Everyone I've taught this game has really enjoyed it. Uh, the theme integration here is top notch. Like you almost get that bit of immersion where you literally are shaving parts off of your deck, ending up with a finer deck at the end. Now, the scoring system's a bit wonky. Though it tends to work as long as you think of the number of cards in your deck, meaning the number of hours you spend on each part, that tends to work. 
And just don't think of the fact that you want nine heads. No, you're spending nine hours working on the face because that's the focal point. Um, we've actually played Chiseled more since you left. We've been enjoying this one so much. I'm not really surprised. I can't see anyone in your family or extended family that wouldn't grok this game and get mm. into it. Now, oddly, the box has this listed as 14 plus, and I don't understand why. Um, thankfully, Board Game Geek community agrees with me as an 8 plus game. Because if you are over 13 years of age, there is less safety testing you need to do on your game. That is the only reason. It's a card game. There's no I, safety testing required. There are I no small know. pieces in the game. So I, that doesn't... That's all, it's someone who <laughs> thinks that they need safety testing Yeah, I, I are under 13. I don't know. That's the reason many, many games... Well, I, I, I'm aware of that, but it, there are no components in this game. It's a deck of cards. Yeah. So I, That's all I can think of is, is the publisher was like, oh, no, we don't want to have to do safety yeah. testing. 14 know. plus. All right. Unfortunately, our chat room isn't willing to take a guess. So our... Most played game of the last ever Sean Con was Point Salad. Uh, this game is so simple, I'll basically teach you to play right here. You take a deck that has an even number of six different ingredients, cards, each which has a scoring mechanic on the back. Shuffle them up, put them into three equal piles with the scoring side flip up, flipped up, or sorry, score, uh, scoring side up, and flip two cards from each stack up to become the market. On your turn, take a point card or take any two ingredient cards and replace any ingredients from the decks above. Keep going until the deck runs out, then everyone totals their points on their scorecards based on what ingredients they've drafted. Now, there is one little rule to throw a little bit of a wrench into that, and that is you can flip over one scoring card you already own to its ingredient side. Just taught you how to play point salad. What'd you think of this pretty simple to learn, but difficult to master card game? Really, the only problem? is that the card quality is not going to hold up to the amount of times it's going to get played. Uh, it's such a simple game. It's hard to understand how no one has really done it before. <laughs> yeah, honestly. This is one of those games like, man, why didn't I think of that? Though I got to say, the the skill required in coming up with the combination of point cards is definitely above any design chops I've got. <laughs> yeah, this one is so good. Like, I, I admit, everyone raved about this this is another one of those super hyped games that i just never got to play until recently and the hypes deserve uh this is one of the easiest to teach games in my collection but not so easy to win um there's lots to pay attention to now, as for the card quality they are definitely thin which i gotta say is an advantage when shuffling and so far they're holding up pretty good but only time will tell how well they hold up overall yeah the key i found to point salad is really anticipation you know what there are six vegetables there. <laughs> That's yep. never going to change. Uh, so decide what you want to score and go for it. Make it happen. Because when you're trying to play catch up, you're leaving just too much to luck as to what point cards are going to come up and be available on your turn. Holy true, though. I've seen someone play it the other way where they just kept collecting veggies and were like, oh, 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 look at that. Oh, <laughs> that scores. So I don't know. I, I don't know if that's valid, but I will admit that's usually how I play. Um, you know what? I don't think we need to say more now because we're at the point now. I played this enough. We, we're already up to a lot of plays for in a short period of time, and I expect more plays this weekend. So you know what? I, I'll officially announce it. We are going to review Point Salad next week. So we'll do a full detailed review next week. That'll be our featured review after our AMA. So more info next week on Point Salad, though, spoiler, we like it a lot. <laughs> Well, that's it for our list of games that uh, we played during this last of the Sean Con. Uh, have you played any of these games? What's your favorite? Uh, let us know down in the comments below. Remember, we're usually here to answer your gaming and game night questions. And yes, we did have people on our Discord asking us what we played. So it's not like we went off on our own here. We just didn't have a nice formalized question for this week. If you got a question for us, though, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hit me up on social media. Welcome to our review of Shikoku, a different type of race game. Before we get started, we have to thank Grand Gamers Guild for getting a copy of this game up to us from Gen Con. Shikoku was designed by Eli Wahadas and features art from Amelia Sales. 
was published in 2018 as a joint effort from Grand Gamers Guild and GDM Games. This is a three to eight player racing game with a twist that plays in about half an hour or so, depending on how much time the players deliberate on their card play. This small box game has an MSRP of 25 bucks US. While having the previously mentioned twist, this is still a rather lightweight game that does involve strategy, but I think a lot of what you get out of this game will depend on who you're playing it with. Fair. So Shikoku is an island in Japan that many people take a pilgrimage to to avert bad luck. They climb the winding steps up to the top of the temples, saying a mantra and leaving a donation on each step. Now in this game, you are playing a set of such pilgrims, each making their way up the set of steps to the temple. Now the interesting thing about this race is that the journey is all about moderation. You don't want to be too fast, as the player who reaches the temple first will be eliminated. You also don't want to be too slow, as the player who is in last place is also eliminated. In this game, it's the players in second and second last that actually win the game. For a look at what you get in Shikoku, I invite you to look at our unboxing video on YouTube. So to me, the components here are just right for this game. Not too fancy, not too bland. Heck, I guess the theme of moderation really comes out in these as well. You get a beautiful looking board that's really just a 33 step track. You get 33 cards that show a traveler on them, a number and some sandals. Cards in eight colors to no player color and a pair of meeple in each of those colors. There's also a set of rules, of course, that are short, succinct and very clear. The component quality here just works. Mm -hmm. So now that you know what you get with Shikoku, Shikoku, how about you give us some more detail on how to play? How do we go about climbing those steps? So to start a game of Shikoku, everyone takes a card and two meeples in the color of their choice. The card deck is shuffled and a number of cards are drawn equal to the number of players. One meeple per player, which is called the Tanter, is randomly assigned to each card, which are then sorted into numerical order. Players then place their other meeple, which is called their Climber, at the bottom of the board at the bottom of the steps and move them up a number of steps equal to the shoes the card their chanter is on. Players are then dealt three cards each from the deck, and the game begins. This setup both sets up the starting player order, as well as giving everyone their starting positions on the stair track. Now, starting with the player on the leftmost card, which at this point at the start of the game will be the lowest card in play, and moving left along the row, each player will play one card from their hand and move their chanter onto that card. Once all players have played a new card and moved their chanter, you then rearrange the cards and put them in numeric order again from left to right. And then some of the climbers move. Now, in general, climbers are going to move the number of sandals shown on the card just played. But remember, the theme of the game is moderation. The climbers on the second and second last card don't move at all. This is a key element of the game and a big part of the strategy mm -hmm. in Shikoku. You want to play cards that make the right players move while others fall behind, as well as making sure you don't move too quickly by making sure your high sandal cards get played in the right order or making sure they uh, get played so you can catch up. Now, once the appropriate climbers have moved, you're going to begin drafting new cards. So first off, the lowest number card and climber, or sorry, and um, chanter are moved to the end of the card. row. So the lowest card goes to the highest spot. That player then gets a random card from the deck. Then the rest of the players are going to draft new cards from the cards that were played that round, like the, sorry, the cards that are already up from the previous round or the ones that are up from the start of the game. Now, at this point, there are always going to be one card left, which is removed from the game. And remember, this is a subset of cards. There's only 33 cards total. What's most interesting here is that the same cards continue to rotate in and out of play with mm -hmm. only one new card added to the mix each round. Here's where card counters are going to get rewarded for keeping track of what cards are in play and which aren't. Now, this is a game I think my father would have loved because he was an expert card counter. Now, play continues like this with playing cards, moving some climbers, then drafting new cards until at least one player hits the top of the track and reaches the temple. Then the current round continues and is finished. Then victory is rewarded to the player or players in second and second last pace. Note this position is based on the step the player's climbers are on at the end of this final round. 
Now, since it came up during our first play, I want to reiterate this. All players who reach the temple on this first round are eliminated. It doesn't matter what order they reach the temple. If you reach the top on that final round, you have lost because you're considered to still be in first. So not the order of arrival, but the order on the physical steps at the mm -hmm. end of the turn in which the first player arrives. Yep. Now that we've basically covered all there is to know to play Shikoku, mm -hmm. it's time to move on to our thoughts on this unique racing game. That's the uniqueness that drew me to this game. So Mark sent me a list of games to potentially review, and I did a bit of research on each of them. And I've got to say, when I read the win condition for this game, I'm like, I got to try that. That alone was enough to make me want to check it out. I'm always looking for games that do something different from everything else in my collection. And here we have a game that scores like nothing else I have. Now, of course, some people are a bit less flexible. And the fact that there isn't always just one winner is going to run rub some people the wrong way. Yes. Personally, as a less competitive player, though, I'm fine with it, and it makes for some really thoughtful turns because of those unique win conditions. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed Sokoku from the first time I played it. Uh, this is a really elegant game that I expected to be more random. I thought it was going to be kind of all over the place. Well, the basics of the game are simple enough that I think you could play with very young kids. Like, really, all you need to know is how to count. You need to know your numbers from 1 to 33. The game really does reward players who pay attention to what cards are in play and who's drafting what. As I said earlier, who you play with is going to determine a lot about this game, including, but not limited to, how long each turn takes as you yes. work out plans and strategy. Yeah, as I noted at the very top, uh, the, the game play time is definitely dependent on how much thought you put into which card you play. Now, I've noticed that everyone who is playing the, um, playing with that level of attention, right? They're not just throwing a random card from their hand. Take great joy in putting down a card that they know can't be messed with or putting down a card that they know bumps them from their chosen spot like bump someone else right so like i'm gonna play in last that now means you're not gonna move and you thought you were going first and that card play and that move that that especially if you're going late in the turn is a very rewarding feeling it kind of makes you feel smart right and to me that's one of the draws of the game it's like oh look what i managed to pull off i think because of the low knowledge entry point Kids can really feel good about playing this game because mm -hmm. of moments just like you mentioned. Now, where things get a bit wonky is when you change up the player counts. With three or four players specifically, it's only the player in second who moves their climber, and it's only the player in second who can win. This just took something away from the game, especially with only three players. The lower player count, the less manipulation of card order that can happen. That, which to me is the real draw of the game. The less of those smart moments where I managed to sneak in between two other players because they forgot I was holding the 16 when they had the 15 and the 17. Now, I've also heard you get a reverse problem once you get to seven or eight players, as so many people are playing cards that you can't really play to get the spot you need, unless you happen to be one of the last two players to play. And then that point, it gets a little too random because... You play your card thinking you're getting away with something just to be bumped all over the order once everyone else is. Playing. Now, unfortunately, with us, sadly, due to the pandemic, we haven't gotten a chance to try the game at that higher. Point. But many other people have identified this problem. In general, though, I think you want at least five players for this particular race game. Yeah, the recommended count is five to seven. And from even just my two plays, I can't say that that doesn't feel right. Yeah. Uh, even without trying all the other counts. Now, earlier we mentioned the component quality was pretty much spot on for this game. I do have one thing I want to add to this. So the background of the game, it talks about 33 being a noteworthy number as well as 42. And it made me wish there was like another nine cards in the game and a second side of the board with 42 steps. Just to give you a bit of variety in your games and allowing you to play a longer game if that's what you'd want. There are, to be fair, a lot of important numbers in Japanese culture, and I don't know in any way pretend to know them. But for reference, 33 and 42 are the ages that apparently mean suffering bad luck, or you will be suffering bad luck 
if you haven't climbed to Temple 23, whose steps number 33. Right. And that's the temple you are actually climbing in this game. So Temple number yeah. 23 uh, uh, at Shikoku. Yeah. Now, the reason I want variety is the one issue I do have with this game is that it can start to feel pretty samey, uh, especially if you play a bunch of games in a short period of time, which is what I happened to do this past weekend. While the player count does really change things up, like playing at four players is a very different experience than playing with five. Individual games at one player count, like playing multiple times at five, do start to feel very similar. You're doing the same thing every turn. You're jockeying for positioning, playing cards number one to 33 out of the three cards you have. Now, I do like Shikoku. I plan on keeping it in my collection, but I think this is best at a game that's going to come out now and then. Something you play a couple of times and then put on the shelf only to bring it out again a month or so later. And it definitely isn't a good tournament game. No, this is not one you're going to see in one of our extra life options. The number of times, because we're talking about the player in first and second, or second and second last. Well, it's technically the player on the second last two and, and second and second last steps. And multiple players can be on that step. So our first five player game, actually three people won. Then that's just not good for tournament. Now that said, we're in the middle of a pandemic still. If I was still running public play events here in Windsor, I could totally see this being one of those games that I just throw in the milk crate, possibly even keep in the van with me, just due to its dead simple rules and high play count. This seems like a great public play, get to know each other games that it'd work as a starter or a filler, or even a game night ender. Indeed, you could get a new player seated and grasping the idea in moments with this game. A really mm -hmm. fantastic way to introduce people to an interesting and different games. Mm -hmm. Though, I would hesitate to call it a gateway game, which is, frankly, an overused term these days anyway. Overall, Shikoku is a very interesting racing game with a cool twist. Features very simple to learn mechanics while still rewarding players who take the time to pay attention and plan ahead. I love the theme and I love the way moderation is integrated in the game in many ways. And I love the fact I now own a game where the players in second and second last come out on top. Indeed, for lightweight games that aren't your standard fare, this certainly fits in a niche. Yeah, if you've got a bigger gaming group that regularly features five or more players, I recommend checking out Shikoku. A very neat game with a short play time that works best at higher player counts. Simple to teach, very accessible, while still having enough meat for experienced gamers. A bigger family with kids, eight and up, I think can really enjoy this one as part of family game night, as it allows more than one winner, which can be a big deal in a family game. Very true. Now, where I can't recommend this one is for groups of four or less, despite what it says on the game box. Like the game doesn't even work with two players, though I gotta admit I'm tempted to sit down and try if we each play two climbers with two players to see if it happens to work, and it's just not as good with three or four. The real draw of this game is getting a large group to sit down and play together, and your group isn't gonna need this if you don't have that higher player count. Well, that's it for our review of Shikoku, a racing game about moderation and not just speed. What's a game you own that sticks out as being totally unique. We'd love to hear about it in the comments below. Now, before we go, I encourage you to like, share, subscribe, or follow. Doing so really does help more people find our content. And I'd like to invite you to check out my written review of Shikoku over at tabletopbellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Well, the games we played without Sean in this case, because <laughs> we've already talked about all the games that played when Sean was gone. So after Sean left on Sunday, we headed over to Brenda's for some more gaming with the extended family. Um, Here's where we played our first four player game in Shikoku, which, as you just heard in our review, didn't go so well. Like it worked, but it just wasn't as much fun. With less than five players, you need that. I need to squeeze my card in. I need to be I need to force someone else to move or Try to squeeze in so I don't move. That's the fun of that game is like and, and making sure you hand the three cards. This is the, the first time you play, you draft whatever you might draft based on the shoes. Eventually, you're going to learn you probably want a low, high and a medium card in your hand. And that becomes a big part of strategy. You don't want to do what I did in our four player game and get to the last round with 15, 16, 17. You're not squeezing in anywhere with those. cards. And with four players, there's just less chance to do that. Once you drop under five, it just doesn't work as well. 
Like, I wouldn't go so far to say the box should say five plus. It is playable with less, but I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, and that's unfortunate, though not altogether surprising, matching what the Board Game Geek users have pretty resoundly said in their play count. Overall, I dig it. Um, I really want to try it with eight. Um, not sure when that can even happen. Maybe, maybe we'll have New Year's this year and we'll finally get this gameplay with eight. I am well, if I do, I'll be sure to let everyone know how it goes. Uh, at this point, I'm I have to assume the other reviewers I've watched and read are right, and it will be too random, but I just want to know for myself. No reason to purely rely on others for all your data points. <laughs> I try not to rely on them for many data points at all. Now, monster games, I needed some help with that one. Uh, next up, Chiseled, new one for Brenda and Gwen, and they both really liked it. Uh, Gwen really took to it. Um, now, the problem was just remember when you play with four, you need to use all nine tools. Um, the start of the game, I only had seven out. I forgot that that was an actual rule change. So if you play with four players, you put more out. And what happens when you play with seven is the same two players keep getting stuck with the last tool. You don't get that whole thing where it rotates around the board so that everyone gets stuck with the tool one after each other. So just fair warning. Remember that. And Cypher Unlimited, thank you for the raid. Welcome. Not come in in the middle of our review. <laughs> Welcome again, Cypher. We're just chatting about a few games we've uh, played in the last weekend. Yeah, so I am currently talking about Chiseled. And I got to say that card count matters. If you're playing Chisel, pay attention to the fact if you play with four, put out nine tools. I'm, I'm digging this game. The theme, how it ties the mechanics, the odd but actually solid scoring system. Um, I will admit, I have switched over to preferring to score my trash pile now because there's usually less cards in it and it's easier to do the math. I look and go, well, I took out five bodies. That means I have four left. I've gotten to that. So I now use the other side of the board. My problem, see my that story. that exa- what you just said was exactly my problem because you want to take out four, not five. And yes. I took out five, not four, and I got confused and lost. Uh, I think you would have beaten me by you one want or two. Five left. You, you want five bodies left. You want to spend five hours chiseling away at your body. Yes. Um, and not that, more, not yeah, less. Absolutely. Uh, honestly, the scoring system, while somewhat abstract, I want to say, is yeah. brilliant. In, especially because how many games give the players two opposite ways to come to the same mm-hmm. score, you know, depending yeah. on whether you want to work from the trash or from your deck. It's, it's really unique that way. Yeah. When I first read it, I actually thought it was like two different scoring things where you were trying to trash the parts you wanted. Mm. Like I totally misunderstood when I read the rule book and it said, you could score your trash or your thing. I didn't realize literally they were the exact same scoring system. Yeah, no, it's, it's easy. It's very easy to mistake that all they've really done is swap that number swap ch- that, that one number yeah. line around. Yes. But uh, but it makes such a big deal and it, it allows people to score the way they think about it. Yes. Which like I said, it, now that I played more times, I now find it way easier to count the arms I've scrapped to figure yep. out if I have to, the, the appropriate. Well, actually, to be honest, it's easier with the bodies and the heads. The arms are actually the, the most complicated yeah. <laughs> one to score. And I got to say, just little things like the fact you need to have spent an even number of hours on both arms is just kind of brilliant. Yep. Now, the one joke we did make is I am waiting for the legs expansion. <laughs> and then we realized that maybe it's because they didn't want to include genitalia because we were looking at the pictures and they all cut off just above the waist. Yep. But I can totally see there being a a a um a leg expansion for chiseled. See, in the future. I want I two. I want two that. things. I want the leg expansion, but then yep. I also want the pope, and I forget which pope it is, with a chisel expansion who goes around knocking off all the genitalia. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we 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 were talking. Yes. I, I'm going to stop with the genitalia jokes, or I keep going. Some were made while we played once we came up with the leg and we were like, the legs would be the arms. Then we were like, do you have to spend an odd number on the legs? Cause they're longer. Like, like we, we totally talked about it. I'm like, and honestly, it should be easy to add. You just add in three legs of the three different suits and then an appropriate number of scrap. And then just, you'd have to change the timing the, the critics would have to take longer to come. And then a new set of tools, even if it's just like three new tools, the, yeah. the mix would totally get changed up. And it was Pope Pius the Ninth expansion is yeah. what we need. Pope, Pope, Pope Pius, Pius the Ninth. Of course, Pope Pius was knocking the nuts off statues. <laughs> <laughs> this is not where I thought this was going to go. <laughs> hey, Raiders, <laughs> well, let's talk about. Welcome. This. We're talking about genitalia chiseled away statues. genitalia. And we were talking about how it's probably acceptable. They just showed everyone from behind like statue butts. So like everyone sees statue butts. Sure. 
Also or fig leaves. I, I mean, fig, there's the a lot of fig leaves too, because they're before before Pius IX went around desecrating yes. statues. They were actually adding in a lot of fig leaves to there make you up go. for fig it. leaves. The fig leaf expansion. There'll be two. <laughs> It'll be like exploding kittens. You can get chiseled the leg expansion and chiseled the not safe for work lower <laughs> loins expansion. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Anyway, chiseled way better than I thought it was going to be. Again, I I I got the game because I got the game because I'm like I wanted to come up with this. The first time I played Dominion, I was already in my head trying to figure out a way to build it backwards. The the I don't I, the the apocalypse where you start with your village and you have to you're the dragon and you have to destroy your village and your your duchies and all that. Like it was in my head and I just never came up with a way to do it. And it's awesome to see someone do it. And yes, I know there's another game out there called Xenon Profiteer. It's all about mining an asteroid. And your deck is the asteroid and you're trying to get, you're trying to to mine out the good stuff and avoid the bad stuff. And and I don't remember, I think in that case, you want the bad stuff to stay in your asteroid. And I, I know it's out there. And uh, whoever publishes that, I would love to check out a copy. I, you um, know what? I just, I just realized uh, there's a great video game that uh, just recently hit my, called Shipbreakers. Where mm-hmm. you are out in the uh, the belt and you are cutting apart uh, y- used up, you know, used spaceships and okay. throwing them into the right part, either the furnace or the recycler, and okay. saving and saving stuff. It would make a fantastic deck deconstruction, deck deconstruction. game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's why I wanted to check out Chisel because I actually had game design ideas for uh, for that type of game. Iphonus Starheart, thank you so much for the follow. Excellent, thank you. All right, last up, this past weekend, played two games of Point Salad. Now, these are games I'm playing with the extended family, my mother-in-law, my kids, my wife. Uh, this was the biggest hit of the night. Not surprising, honestly. I don't I don't think this should be surprising at all, uh, based on what we already talked about earlier during the main segment. The game is brilliant. Like, it it really is. It's It's one of those you look at it and go, wow, how did it take so long for someone to design this? It is so quick to set up. Yes, it's slightly annoying to have to either count out or count in a number of cards at the beginning of the game. What I recommend is at the end of your game, just sort everything. So then the next time you play, it's easy to count off. That's what we started doing now. Um, I love the fact that so far there doesn't seem to be a dominant strategy. Though I have noticed players seem to stick to one or two things. They try to collect two or three ingredients or they play Pokemon and try to catch them all. And honestly, I've seen the limited option seems to win more often. Though I have seen the other win once now, too. So th- what I like is I haven't seen a dominant strategy. And the one thing I did notice, so Sean earlier suggested, like, just pick a couple vegetables that you're going to collect and then try to find the point cards. When you were playing at lower player counts, you remove more cards from the game. And there's a good chance there might not be as many scoring cards for that vegetable, which I actually think is a feature of the game. But you do have to be a little careful. But the whole thing is, it's a game about adapt. You start collecting one thing, but then when three other point cards come up that are better, you're like, oh, heck, of course I'm going to switch to doing this. And that whole rule where you can convert your point card into a vegetable, I use that almost every game now. Because I honestly, I, I tend to start the game by grabbing a point card. Just what, out of the three that are up, whatever looks the most interesting, looks like I'm going to be able to do, I'm going to grab that. And then I start working on that. But then... The last game, I totally focused on one thing. And by the end of the game, I had flipped over my first three point cards to veggies and went a totally different way. Yeah, it was interesting. That last three player game we had, um, I managed to go all in on onions. And so, I mean, I was scoring uh, three or four different cards Mm -hmm. for every onion. Um, And, you know, and it worked out fantastically, but it could have just as easily gone in a very poor way for me uh but because i committed early on to i think you know onions and carrots um Mm -hmm. they worked out so you you do need to pay attention to your opponents and and watch out that you know they are pulling out things like that that is that is the next level of the game that i'm also doing a bit of but i still am more focused on kind of getting a balance of what's out there but the whole don't let them get that card they are already scoring for Yes. is a big part of that game that I haven't delved into enough. That's one of the things that's going to come with Game Mastery, where sometimes I notice it, and I'm like, oh, they have, like, all the lettuce, and there's a card that gives five points for every two lettuce, and they already have eight of them. We can't let them get that. Of course, then I do the Jedi Mind Trick and try to convince one of the other players to get it. 
grab that so they can't get it so I can go do what I want to do. That's how I play games. But yeah, um, one thing that's kind of neat about this one is like, I can't remember the last game where we played like six times in one weekend that wasn't like a review copy and an obligation to get it done. Like this is a game I picked up in Campbellford, Ontario because I'd heard lots of good things and they had a really good price at this one little tiny bookstore. And I'm like, oh, this might be fun to play with my aunt and uncle. And man, I'm kicking myself. We so should have opened it up. Like, sorry, <laughs> fans who like our unboxing videos. I should have cracked that open in Campbellford. I think my aunt would have loved this game. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, so we already announced it. Point solid. We basically just gave you our thoughts, but we're going to do a full detailed review so that we get a nice shiny video out there on YouTube so people can watch it. Um, I'll get into the how to play in a little bit more detail. And I'm sure at this point we're going to get in a couple more plays um, before our final thoughts on that. I don't expect anything to change. Uh, maybe we'll have that weird flute game and I'm like, no, nah, point salad's broken, but I don't see it happening. Um, I fully expected to be opening packages during our, our uh, after show here. And well, it didn't. I, I have three packages coming according to the shipping notifications I've been getting lately. Uh, one tied up in uh, customs, and I've got to say shout out to the op for taking that on and handling it and contacting customs themselves. So that one's now out of my hands, which is awesome. Um, there's another one that seems to have vanished. Um, we can track it to the U.S. and we can track it to Chicago. And then it just last update was the 13th of this month. Um, so the publisher is offering to send another copy. I'm kind of said, no, it's up to you. You know, it's at your cost if you want to do it. Um, then I got a FedEx notification. I have no idea who it's from. It's coming from within Canada. So there, there's a chance that might be a Stonemeyer game. It's inside um, the country. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's a chance that's a Stonemeyer game. And uh, the only thing I will spoil is it's an expansion and it's not for Scythe, which I kind of wish I did get offered a Scythe expansion, <laughs> but it didn't. Um, so I was thinking we probably have some unboxings to do, but I guess not. Um, I do still have stuff here to unbox um, from the last shipment that came in. I have Belgian Beer Race and the B-Movie expansion for Roll Camera, but I tend to like to save up five games to unbox. So until that other shipment comes off, plus we still got, what, two, three left, I think? Uh, yeah, a couple From our three. last group of unboxings. A couple of Like, three. we've already got our one for next Monday ready to roll, so. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah I, I, did, I, did have to, I did have to tweak that one down, though, because when you were opening it, you thought there'd be expansions. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Nope. Yeah, that one I made some mistakes. I I I try to figure some stuff out. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Deanna and I are taking a, a few days off next week. It feels like I announced that a lot. We really don't take nearly as many vacations. The thing is, we take like one or two days off now and then. Get away. So yeah, we got other. we've got uh, Aldibus, uh, Racco, and Cowboy Bebop. Plus, didn't we still have some older stuff? But it's kind of man. Well, the dice. Yeah, that's all that's left is a dice. Uh, I believe so. Oh, and Sheep of Stone, which yeah. <laughs> Sheep of Stone's been sitting there for I don't even know. Well, since, yeah, because uh, since last year, year, actually, since Jan yeah. since December of twenty twenty one. That's our pocket one. Yeah. Yes, I did. As Deanna said, we figured out we can afford to go away one night a month, <laughs> and yep. yeah, and my mom lives here, so. Yeah, we are we are trying to get away. So yes, Monday, Tuesday, next week we there are people here. We will be. I know. Don't announce you're not going to be in town. Yeah, there's people there. It's not empty. like the house is empty. Exactly. It's not like the house is empty. Yep. So yeah, um, we're hoping to get everything scheduled and ready to go. So that's the big thing. Um, Deanna and I are going somewhere together. You know what? We'll bring games. Big Expecting shock. Point Salad to be one of them. I'm not sure what else. Chiseled probably. Yeah, this is a nice small footprint, really. It's just a sort of, sort of. Yeah, uh, chiseled too. That's interesting. Yep. Hmm. Oh, D wants to get the Duke again. Oh, there we See, go. We played the Duke the last time we just went remember out. your shield rules. Wants revenge because she was going to beat me. <laughs> yes, he was going to totally destroy me, and then they kicked us off the patio. All righty. Oh yeah. Now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Welcome, Derek Hisson, the latest Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron. Andrew Dacey, thank you, Andrew. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Mom. Brian Van Beek, thank you, Brian. 
the Misdirected Mark podcast. Talking games and game mastery every week. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Dig in the show, just like the people we just thanked. You can support us over at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and you're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.